I have written two scientific papers in my life, one for academics and one as a hobby. Neither have been published. I only have my bachelor's in microbiology, so paper writing is not really taught until one goes for a graduate degree, where one gets one-on-one -on -one training from an instructor. Publishing is not done by earlier amateur scientists thanks to their lack of experience. Even postgraduate students rarely get control of their own experiments or make final conclusions about their findings. My first paper was in a required research class in the final semester of college. It was actually a mini thesis that was used later by the professor along with the research done by the rest of the class for final publication. The paper was to report my findings on Calobacter crescentis, a bacteria that resides in most water with a stalk and at the end of that stalk is an adhesive that is the strongest known on the planet. It is years and perhaps decades away from actual use and production, but that's how science works. What's cool is that I isolated a strain I mutated that produced a monster amount of adhesive, so I may have helped a little in the production of this adhesive. I was so sick of the paper and ready to graduate that the paper got turned in and after editing last minute I got a C on it. I did not understand the peer review process or why I had to have so many freaking citations. It was assumed that I understood the importance of paper writing. I probably had too little citations and my spelling and grammar were atrocious as I seemed to fail at spell checking unless it's in a hard copy. Plus, I didn't care at that point, I just wanted to graduate. Senioritis is a bitch. I read it months later while waiting for an interview and I was shocked as to how bad the spelling in it was. Uh, it must have been painful to grade. My second paper is an academic science paper. I did as a hobby that I have yet to try and get published because I hit a research brick wall that may or may not be a well-studied field. With this paper on anthropological evolution, I started to fully understand the importance of journal writing and peer review. The paper is sitting in limbo until I have the energy to track down the right type of professor who may have insight on whether or not there has been uh, any conclusive studies on the effects that pinched or damaged spinal nerves have on the endocrine system. Depending on the data, I may have to do even more digging if it opens up another needed citation. This is a personal project, and if I complete it without disproving it to myself, I will find a professor in the field to look over it and see if the paper comes even close to flying. They spent decades of their life in constant study, and after all my work, they may still be able to easily spot something that I would have had no way of knowing. That is the reason why there is speciality in science. There is way too much, even in one field of study, for one to know. Science is a lot of hard and thankless work. It is a fight for truth and accuracy that you may or may not get paid for, and you certainly won't get paid very much for the amount of effort you put into it, compared to other careers, which is why there is such a shortage and an ignorance about it. We seem to outsource it more and more these days. Creationists have no idea how much grueling and difficult work Charles Darwin had to go through attempting to find anything in research that would disprove his theory. Why? Because it will get torn down and tossed in the trash if you use a faulty premise for your work or forget a known violation of the fact and evidence. You have to be harder on yourself than they are or you could fail miserably. Every fact you assert in a paper has to be cited if it is not a basic understanding of the field. Jargon is pushed in use of journal writing as a way to show that you have these basic understandings and will increase your chances of getting published. Or else, or else they may question your knowledge level and ask for more citations. As I did not have an education in the field my paper was in, the amount of citations I had to use was staggering because I didn't know what is common knowledge and what is not. When I first wrote the paper, I used very few citations and used a lot of facts I had heard somewhere, which I assumed were true and from a reliable source. As I began to discuss my idea with more skeptical and science-minded friends, they began to ask me where I got my sources. I became frustrated because I didn't have them anymore. They were from a news article that had been deleted. It seemed like they wanted the impossible. No one can cite sources for every fact they state. Well, sorry, but in science you have to, or you can't make discoveries public. And that is why speciality is so important in science. 
After I finally came to accept what they were saying and realized there was no way my paper would get published if I didn't cite every little detail, I went back and picked it apart and began doing the arduous task of citation. Thanks to my understanding of citation, I now collect links to all my sites that had information I found interesting. And if I know they're the types of sites that delete their info over time, like Yahoo News, I'll copy and paste the article and save it. From these citations in these articles, I can find the original paper. From the citations in these articles, I can find the original paper, and from there I can go to the college library to track them down or other citations needed. I also had to be informed that I must use original sources in everything I cite. I knew this from my first paper because these were the assignment parameters, but most of my ideas I kicked around were made from second or third sources. I didn't realize until later just how badly using a news journal can distort the findings and perceived certainty of the data. Most scientists present data and findings. News articles many times present things as fact, which is why the public sees the scientific community as always changing its mind. When science has never had its mind made up, it was still studying. Because it is so picky and precise, science is self-correcting. Scientists also use sources cited in journals by previously peer-reviewed findings, and they will never use citations by non-scientists. Citations prevent error rates considerably more than any other process of ascertaining truth. Each paper has many citations, each of which of them have experiments and data and citations from other papers, each one built on ones before it. And of course, this diagram really could only be ju done justice with a pyramid. If one of these papers is found to be invalid because it was built on so many citations, it will not make the data useless, but it will better support the newer adjusted model as it has been refined now to be more accurate. It is still a solid theory, just better understood. We stand on the shoulders of giants, and peer review involves everyone from the science community, including people long dead. Everything is carefully built off the last carefully studied and repeated experiments and discoveries. People who ignore well-documented science and don't cite all their sources from credible sources are called pseudoscientists. People with sufficient evidence to back everything up, or at least know that their results need further studies, are called scientists. Pseudoscience may use one or a few sources and quote from them exclusively, and then expand their imagination on what this could imply. This sort of exercise makes for great sci-fi, but when people believe it and publish it without evidence, they can cause great harm with the sensationalism it can cause, especially when they say it's a big cover-up, be it science, the medical community, the government, or the Illuminati. Because they have not had it deeply scrutinized by the field they are discussing, they will make glaring errors to anyone in that field, but it will seem plausible to people outside the community who don't know enough. Anytime someone from the community tries to point it out, the pseudoscientist screams persecution and his followers repeat the lie, being good at whatever apologetics their leader spews, just like Glenn Beck does. The problem is that pseudoscience is in the business for fame, adoration, or cash. Real scientists are rarely rock stars. Neil deGrasse Tyson may be an exception. <laughs> Most get into it because they want to make a difference and help human understanding. Finding a money-making or earth-shattering discovery is always a dream in the back of their mind, but they have to be very skeptical of their own findings throughout the process, or they could end up biasing their own experiment. They have something at stake and will probably really hope that their findings are repeatable and verifiable. And until they get confirmation that they are correct by people who do not have a stake in their discovery, they cannot claim, fun they cannot claim fame or money. Money which they would put right back into further research, most likely. Pseudoscience uses the gullibility of people the same way a cult leader does, and their ego drives them more than their quest for truth. I used to think exactly like this. I dreamed the idea of making a great discovery that would change the world. I did feel persecuted a bit when people challenged my beliefs without sufficient evidence. I'm lucky I was lazy at writing back then, or I could have published some books and got caught up in my own cult beliefs. I used to have a unifying hypothesis of physics based on my naval nuclear understanding of particle physics and my observations in electricity. There is so much I would need to know about physics to verify and back myself up on this. It would take my entire life with my very bad calculus skills only to probably find everything about it was wrong as early as my undergraduate years. 
only someone with years of postdoctoral experience in subatomic particle physics should even attempt this sort of claim, and even they would have to work hard at the uphill battle to prove that they are correct through the scientific process just like any other scientist before them. I think I'll leave this idea in the dustbin of ideas and let the experts do what they do. If there was an ungodly chance that it turned out I was correct, the scientists who discovered it would have infinitely more evidence both mathematically and based on prior evidence than I could ever produce. My idea may even have a bit of truth to it, just like the ancient philosophers had on just about everything, but got a whole lot of it wrong. If my limbo paper I work on got rejected, I would not claim persecution. I'm not in it for the fame, I'm not in that field. I would be a bit disappointed it got rejected after all the work, but I would also be excited and fascinated to learn why I was wrong. A pseudoscience will just plug their ears and scream persecution. A scientist picks him or herself back up and gets back to work. Science is not a place for the weak or the whiners. It is the place for the thankless hard workers who are hungry for the truth and love to expand the understanding of all of the human species.